Well, I'm excited to dive right in with our next lesson in our series on how to study the Bible. I just want to do a couple of things by way of review. Remember that in our first lesson, we basically just made the point that everybody teaches in one way or another. Probably the most basic way that we all teach is by the example that we set by the way that we live. But right on the way up to being a parent or a Bible class teacher or an elder in a congregation or a preacher, all points in between all of us in one way or another teach. And secondly, um, all of us who teach ultimately are going to have to follow the same pattern that we find in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10, which I talked with you about in the last class. The text tells us that Ezra set his heart to study or seek the law of God and to practice it and then to teach it. And so those three steps are the same steps we all are going to have to follow. First of all, we have to learn the word of God. And then we have to live it out. It really has to become something that is not just simply a sales pitch or a message, but it really is a, a reflection of who we actually are. And then we're in a position to be able to influence other people with the truth that we have learned and with the truth that we have internalized. So that's what we talked about in the first two lessons. Before we move on to lesson number three, I wanted to make just a, a couple of extra points by way of encouragement for all of us. First of all, um, even though this is part of what will ultimately be a class designed to help people learn how to teach an adult Bible class, the part of the, of the class that we are in right now, which is how to study the Bible, is a part of this class that is applicable to everybody who is old enough to be able to actually understand what I'm saying. So those of you who are in high school, those of you are who, who are in junior high school, in fact, I think those of you who are mature elementary school kids, all of you can really, if you will apply yourself, get something out of these early lessons in this series. In fact, I have to be honest with you, I wish that somebody, when I was in junior high or high school, would have sat down and actually showed me how to study. Now, I, I was in a lot of Bible studies for sure, and I learned an awful lot, but nobody ever actually taught me how to study on my own. And you know, that's quite ironic in a way because um, a lot of us grow, grow up in a culture in which we emphasize, you know, that um, we speak where the Bible speaks, that each person is responsible to investigate the truth of God's word for himself or for herself. And yet, quite honestly, I was never really taught how to go about doing that, how to actually live out the motto of speaking where the Bible speaks. I think so often in the past, I was content to know a handful of verses about a few pet topics really, really well, but not really know the big picture of the Bible story and certainly not know how to study a book of the Bible uh, on its own terms. So I just want to encourage uh, all of us um, to understand that there's something in this early section of this class for everybody, especially for those of you who are junior high school and high school. Uh, I, I really want to encourage you uh, to take advantage of this part of the, of the class. So, in the last lesson, I, I made reference to a passage in 2 Timothy where Paul talks to Timothy about being a good workman. And the idea that as someone who's going to teach the Word of God, which, remember, is all of us in one way or another, that um, we have to have a workmanlike spirit um, as we study the Word of God. So, the most basic uh, tool of all that we're going to use as students of Scripture is the Bible itself. So I thought what I would do in this lesson is talk about the issue of what version of the Bible or what translation of the Bible um, should I use as a part of my, my tool chest to learn how to become a good worker 
in the Word. I actually get this question fairly often, either from our members and sometimes also from people elsewhere about what versions and what translations do I recommend. And of course, you guys know that I, I teach and preach from the English Standard Version, but uh, you also, I'm sure, have picked up on the fact that just about every sermon in Bible class, I make reference to what several other translations say. So what I want to do in this lesson is explain just a little bit about why we have all of these translations and how to how to make effective use of them. I know that sometimes I will hear my uh, my friends who are non Christians make disparaging comments like, "Well, how do you know what Bible what, what Bible to read? How do you even know what the Bible says? I mean, it's been translated so many different ways." But I really want to make the point in this class that the fact that we have so many uh, translations of the Bible is indeed a wonderful blessing. So I want to talk about some of the underlying reasons why we have so many translations, and then we'll talk about how to make effective use of them as, um, as students of the Bible. Now, let's be sure that we understand something. Um, it, the reason that we have so many translations of the Bible is not because uh, God is a God of confusion and just couldn't make up his mind what he wanted to say, so he said it a bunch of different ways. That's that's not the case at all. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1 that the holy men of old spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, this is what Scripture uh, describes as inspiration, the process by which God worked through human authors but worked through them in such a way that by his spirit he guided them so that what they said was was the truth and it was exactly it was exactly what god wanted uh but so therefore the reason that there is uh, there's so many translations not because god you know just really couldn't make up his mind that that isn't it, it at all the scripture reflects uh the orderly rational mind of god himself there are really two primary reasons why we have so many versions of the Bible. One of those has to do with just the process by which the original scriptures have come down to us, and the other has to do with what you might say is the purpose behind a translation. So let's take those two points in order. First of all, how the Bible has come to us. Well, we understand, of course, that we do not have any of the original manuscripts that Peter or Paul or Matthew or Luke actually wrote. What we have are copies, uh, copies of copies that have come down to us from the time of the first century. Uh, we know that in the Old Testament era, there, there was an entire class of people called scribes, who specialized in carefully copying uh, the manuscripts of the Old Testament. And you know that the scribes are mentioned in the New Testament as well, often in the Gospels. Uh, Ezra, who we talked about a little bit in the previous lesson, was a scribe. Uh, and we also can see uh, snippets in the New Testament that speak of this process of copying and circulating letters. Let me just show you a couple of passages that speak to this. I'm turning, first of all, to the book of Colossians, to the fourth chapter, Colossians chapter 4. At the end of the letter, Paul gives some instructions to the Colossians about what they are to do with the letter, letter that they have from him. So this is in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 16. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. So what you can see here is that the early Christians, when they received letters from the apostles, they would circulate these letters. They would, they would pass them around so that all of the churches could have access to the apostolic teaching. Paul says, you've got a letter from me. I want you to send it on over to the Laodiceans. They've got one of my letters, and when it comes from them, I'm, they're going to pass it around to you, and I want you to read it. So we know that the early Christians were circulating these letters. We also know that as a part of that circulation process, they were copying them and they were collecting them. How do we know this? We know this because if you look over in the book of 2 Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, the apostle Peter can speak of the letters of Paul 
as a known entity, as a known collection. Uh, so in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says in verse 15, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Notice, as he does in all his letters. By the time Peter wrote 2 Peter, Paul's letters were known essentially as a collection because they had been circulated around, copied and circulated around the churches of the first century world. So we don't have the originals. We have copies. We have copies of copies. Now, over the course of time, as these letters and manuscripts were copied and passed down, certain variations began to develop among these manuscripts. There's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, one of the most common variations that you can see in the Greek manuscripts has to do with spelling the name of John. Whether to spell it with uh, one letter N, in, in Greek it would be the letter nu, or with two letter N's or two letter news. And of course, if they were, if you can imagine a room with a scribe dictating the words and then the other scribes writing it down, if a scribe just says the, the name Iano, if they just say the name John, then whether you use one N or two is going to depend on how you've come to know the word John, the name John. And so that's one of the most common variations you see when you look at the different Greek manuscripts is how to spell the name John. Another one that you'll see quite often is, is it Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ? A lot of times that order is inverted. And there are other reasons that you would see these variations take place. I, I noticed that uh, I have a plaque in my office, which by the way, I really wanted to record it there tonight but I can't get the lighting right. So I do it out here in part because I like to play this little game on the counter, but I, I can get better lighting here than I can in my office right now. Anyway, but I have a plaque in there that was given to me back when I used to teach at Florida College. I had that plaque for uh, almost 15 years before I noticed somebody else pointed it out to me that the same word that's at the end of one line is also repeated at the start of the next line. So there's a there's a typo. It's right there in this plaque, and I've had it for years and never noticed. Well, that's another one of these common variations you will see when words are, are duplicated like that. Um, and sometimes these variations will happen when a scribe is working on a manuscript and he makes a little note over in the margin about something. But then when the next scribe gets that and he's making his copy, he may think, oh, he intended for that to go into the text. So sometimes those are called uh, scribal glosses. But you can spot them a mile away when you're comparing all of these different manuscripts if that's your, if that's your line of work. Now, I realize that uh, there are some people when they first hear talk about all of these copies of copies and that there's variations and we don't have the original, that it, it troubles them for a little bit because maybe they've not heard that before. But as I said at the very start, this is, uh, this is a wonderful problem to have. And the reason that it's a wonderful problem to have is because by virtue of the fact that we have so many different manuscripts, many of which date back within just a few years of the writing of the books of the New Testament, we can easily see where the major variations are. We can spot them just like that, and we can determine whether they are significant or not. And as it turns out, they are not significant. So let me just show you an example. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I preached to you... Uh, from the gospel accounts of the resurrection of Jesus, and I pointed out to you that there is a discrepancy in the textual evidence of Mark chapter 16. And if you remember, I pointed out to you that if you look at verse 9, that your Bible may have like, I don't know if you can see this or not, but mine has a bracket that sets uh, verse 9 through the end of the chapter off, and it says some of the earliest manuscripts do not include those verses. So the section of Mark 16, verses 9 through 20, is the largest of these variations in the Greek manuscripts. 
And yet, think about it. Is there anything in that section of Mark that isn't also found in other parts of the New Testament Gospels that are not under any dispute or question at all? The, the, that section of the Gospel of Mark talks to us about the resurrection appearance of Jesus. Uh, it talks about the Great Commission. It talks about what Jesus wants the apostles to teach and to do. There isn't anything content-wise that isn't found elsewhere in the New Testament, and that's the largest example of a variation. Now, the reason I'm getting into all of this is to help you understand one of the two primary reasons we have so many different versions. So uh, I'm going to use here a very fancy visual aid. I mean, is this not just fantastic or what? I thought about asking Jackson to sneak in some PowerPoint slides, but you know what? Just imagine this is a this is a chalkboard. So let this here stand for the original. Let's say that's the Gospel of Mark. And then you can see we have copies and then copies of copies and copies of copies of copies on down through time. So this is, you know, let's say that's the year 70 AD. And then we have copies that go down, let's say, even to the year 500 or something like that. You get the idea here, right? So then I really did not do a great job drawing this chart, but I tried to indicate that some of these copies are similar to each other because they're rectangles. Some are similar to each other because they're triangles and some because they are circles. And what that is a reference to is the fact that as you come down through the manuscripts, you can see that maybe there's some of them that spell John with one N. And then there are others that spell John with two N's. There are some that say Christ Jesus and there are some that say Jesus Christ in some of those passages, okay? So these variations then create these patterns in which you have some manuscripts that tend toward one thing and some that tend toward the other. All right, now, very roughly, very simplistically, very oversimplistically, translators have to make a decision which family of these manuscripts that they want to use as the basis of their translation. And here is, again, very oversimplified their choice. Do we use the oldest manuscripts? There are fewer of them because they are older, so they haven't survived over time. So do we use those manuscripts that are older even though they are fewer? Or do we use those manuscripts that are more numerous but they are they are newer compared to these that are older. All right. So if if I were to ask you to take a vote, if you say, you know, I think even though there's fewer of them, we should use the older manuscripts, then you would agree with the philosophy behind the New American Standard Bible, the English Standard Version, the NIV. If on the other hand you believe, well, even though there's a lot of time. After the original, I think we, we should still use the manuscripts that are in the majority. There's more of them, even though they are further from the original in time. That's the philosophy behind the King James Version and the New King James Version. So that's one basic option that translators have to make is sort of which, which of these manuscript histories do we want to follow? Uh, so that's the reason why a lot of times those of you who use the New King James Version, you may have more words in certain verses than some of us have who are using New American Standard Bibles or English Standard Versions because the majority of these these manuscripts down here tend to add rather than, than to subtract, okay? The great thing, though, is we know where all of those spots are, and we know that as you compare those differences between the, the, the manuscripts, uh, just as you compare, to, to simplify it again, reading, let's say, a New American Standard versus a New King James Version, you'll see where the differences are, and you'll recognize that there's certainly nothing at stake that Christianity hinges on. All right? That's the first issue. But it's a good problem to have. It's good to have so many manuscripts that we can check and compare and weigh against each other. All right, here is the second reason why we have so many different translations. Um, and that's because translators have to make a decision between how literal they want to translate the words from one language into the words of another language versus how readable they want to translate the words of one language into another language. 
Let me give you a couple of examples. I, I had one year of French in school, so I'm going to totally bungle these uh, French sentences in terms of the pronunciation. But here's a French sentence. C'est la fin de Hericot. Now, if you translate that literally, it says, that's the end of the beans. But if you translate it in a way that's more readable and understandable, it's, it's the last straw. So the end of the beans. In other words, we're out. Uh, it's the last straw. We have no more resources. Les carottes sont cuites. That literally is the carrots are cooked. But if we were to put that into a phrase that's understandable to us, I've had it. Okay. Uh, Arrête ton char. Uh, which is in French, stop the chariot. <laughs> but if we were to put it into a phrase that in English uh, we would understand, it's stop bluffing. All right. Now, let me read the translations I just gave you from each of those. That's the end of the beans versus it's the last straw. Very different words, but to convey the same idea. The carrots are cooked. I've had it. Uh, stop the chariot. Stop bluffing. All right. So you understand then that if someone's going to translate from one language to another, they're trying to balance. How do I translate this in words that capture the original language, but at the same time conveys the thought into a, a, a way that's understandable in the new language. All right, that's why there are so many different translations. Different translations have a different purpose in terms of where they want to fall on that spectrum. So in your handout, you have this chart. I'm gonna hold it up for you so you can see it here as well. So you can see that over here it says word for word, over here it says thought for thought. Another way to think about this is here is on the end of the spectrum that's more literal, and here is on the end of the spectrum that is more readable. Now, the thing that I want you all to see on this chart is there are no right and wrong translations. Each of these translations is exactly where it wanted to be on this spectrum. And so, for example, if you look over here more toward the uh, more literal or word-for-word -word side of the equation, you can see uh, an interlinear. That would be where you literally just take the Greek words and right underneath, right underneath them translate into the English words. And then you can see the New American Standard Bible is a very literal translation. And then just to the, to the right of that is the ESV and then the King James Version and New King James Version. All right. So those translations are more on the more literal word for word end of the equation. And then down here on this end, maybe some of you were raised uh, when I was a little kid, I got a living Bible. All right, that's a paraphrase where the writer is saying, okay, here's the basic thought of the biblical writer. Let me put that into thoughts, uh, into words that express the thought in a way that maybe a child can understand. Uh, and then you can see these other translations here as well. And then sort of right in the middle, you can see uh, the NIV, the New, New International Version, which kind of falls right there into the middle. So... Um, this is also a wonderful problem to have because we have multiple translations that are trying to give us as literal a rendering as we can get while still being understandable versus those that are saying, okay, we really want, want you to get the thought that the author was conveying, all right? So it's a wonderful problem to have so many translations to choose from. Uh, so let me give you an, a passage that illustrates the differences between uh, how translations that fall on this spectrum handle the verse. So if you want to go ahead and turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12 if you were to just do it, like literally go from Greek to English, Greek to English, Greek to English, word by word, it would sound something like this. Not be anguished in us, be anguished, but in the bowels of you. Now, that's word for word, but it's not very understandable. 
The King James Version says, ye are not straightened. And notice that's not straightened with a G-H. That's straightened, S-T-R-A-I-T. It's an older English word, which means pressed or, you know, put through the ringer. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now, the King James is maintaining the ancient language in which uh, the seed of affection and emotion was not the heart, but was, in fact, the intestines. All right, now the New American Standard. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. The ESV, you are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. Now, moving more to the middle of that spectrum, the NIV says, we are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. Then the New Living Translation says, there is no lack of love on our part, but you have withheld your love from us. Now, you know, actually to convey the basic gist of what Paul is saying, that's, that is a really good translation. In fact, I often like uh, taking a look at the NLT just to kind of see how it treats a passage. And then the message, which, which is basically a one-man paraphrase, we didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. So anyway, I wanted you to just get an idea of, you know, one reason they're different translations is there's sort of a technical issue about how to handle the Greek manuscript tradition, etc. But the, the primary reason we have so many different translations is because different translations are trying to hit different spots on that spectrum. So here is what I, I recommend. In my daily Bible reading, um, right now I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. Uh, but when I preach and when I teach, as I prepare for class, I try to look at several different translations. Because so many of you use the New American Standard or the New King James or the NIV, I try to always uh, take a look at those other translations. Uh, because uh, not only is it that so many of you use them, and I kind of want to know what you're looking at as you're following along with me, but because that gives me two other, you know, really solid uh, word for word ish, more literal translations to compare with, plus the NIV, which is more in the middle of the spectrum. And then I often will also take a peek at the New Living Translation, which is again more on this side of the spectrum that's the more readable but less literal and just kind of get a feel for, for how it treats the passage as, as well. And a lot of times when I summarize the meaning of a text, uh, I'll often do it in the language of the New Living Translation or one of those other translations in that, in that part of the spectrum. Um, it used to be in the old days you either had to own each individual one of these translations, which is expensive and takes up a lot of room, um, or they used to make these gigantic, really big, you know, New Testament and 28 translation books. I used to have one of those. But now, thanks to uh, apps and websites like BibleGateway.com, uh, we just have a plethora of riches at our fingertips to be able to, to compare different, different translations. So in terms of uh, what translation I recommend, what I recommend is that, you know, whatever you pick as your primary reading translation, that just like, uh, you know, a good carpenter wants to have, you know, a well-supplied tool chest, uh, think of these different translations as different tools to have for different purposes. So I would definitely make sure that I've got a good translation like the ESV or New American Standard or New King James Version as a good foundation for study, but also take a look at the NIV for comparison and then maybe something like the New Living Translation. And as you do that and you start to see some of the differences, it kind of clues you into what must be some of the underlying issues that translators are grappling with that will help you come to grips with, with how to really dig in there and study the text. But that is for our next lesson, if the Lord wills. So in the meantime, I hope that this has given you some, uh, some sense of a, a good foundation for understanding the, the role and purpose of different translations. 
And most of all, I, as is often said, the best translation is the one that you read. And I really hope that you're following along doing a daily Bible reading of some kind, maybe the one that some of us have been doing that I, that I sent out. I know some of you have another one that you like to do. But the key thing is the translation that's the best is the one that you'll read. And so just be sure that you, uh, you're taking some time uh, to, to stay in the Word, and that'll go a long way toward helping us all become better learners of the Word, doers of the Word, and ultimately teachers of the Word. But we'll move on with our next lesson, if the good Lord wills, uh, on Wednesday night. But in the meantime, I hope you all have had a great Lord's Day, and I hope that your week gets off to a really good start. We'll see you then.